Dear friends, welcome so much to the Fit World Foundation on this lovely summer's evening. And thank you for sacrificing parts of it in order to take part in our event entitled What are Taboos? <clears throat> it's a fascinating topic indeed. My name is uh, Knut Ola Womos. I'm Executive Director of Fit World. And this event is a close collaboration with two partners with Index on Censorship, the award-winning and extremely interesting and uh, important magazine on free expression globally. And uh, Fritur is proud to be one of the, their funders and partners through many years. Uh, but the event is also a collaboration with the Free World Centre in London, situated in a house in London and uh, owned by Fritur. And we are so happy to have that, the director, Rose Fenton, here. So please, Rose, the floor is yours for a minute or two to tell us about uh, the uh, unique Free World Center, please. Thank you, Ms. Villa. And it's wonderful to be here, and we're absolutely delighted to be working with Fritord and Index, a long-time collaborator both, on, on this evening. And, and just to say a very few brief words about Free Word, the Free Word Centre. Um, we describe ourselves as an international centre for literature, literacy and free expression that explores and celebrates the power of words to change lives. And, and it's very important, these three components, literature, literacy and free expression, because they cannot exist in isolation. And um, Free Word is home to a remarkable community of organisations working across literature, literacy and free expression. Um, the uh, Article 19, who fight for free expression around the world, um, English Pen, who fight for the freedom to write, the freedom to read, and are part of the whole International Pen Organisation, but also literature organisations such as Avon, who, who work with writers up and down the country to help them develop their craft, or the Reading Agency, who work with libraries to get more people to read more books, because everything changes when we read. They work with children um, with disadvantaged communities and so we are a very very strong community and, and the free word center is home to all of them but also to many associates who come and use us as their london base um, and so we we do our own programs as well and uh, we have worked um, on a pro whole series of programs around europe at the moment looking at what are the conditions in europe that really are beginning to alarm us in terms of free expression in terms of human rights, in terms of lack of solidarity, and of course, you know, here we are, Britain, on the eve of a referendum. We hope and pray we will stay part of Europe, but these are worrying times across our continent. Um, I would like to say I'm particularly pleased because, in a way, Fritterord, I would describe as a free words mothership, um, or, or free word as uh, Fritterord's. Um, uh, London outpost because we opened our doors in 2009 and we are indeed the result of a joint venture between Fritord and the Arts Council spearheaded by one of our founding our founding trustee Ursula Owen who is here with us this evening who at the time was director of Index on Censorship. Index on Censorship are one of our founding members and a strong associate so it's absolutely wonderful that Fritord, Index and Free Word Centre are coming together for this evening. Uh, Fritord have done many events with us down back in London at the Free Word Centre. Um, and we've worked with many Norwegian artists over, over the years. But actually this is the first time that uh, Free Word have come to Oslo to do an event. And I really hope this is one, uh, this will set a pattern and it's the first of many. So um, once again, Thank you, Knutu Alaus, and thank you, Fritord, for inviting us to be part of this this evening. Yeah, I urge you all to, to visit the uh, Free World Centre if you are in London. It's uh, located in East Lincoln, in Farringdon Road, and uh, it, has, it also has a nice cafe. <laughs> and on the plane, on the plane, uh, to or from, you can read in the index on censorship. <laughs> <laughs> well,
we'll, we'll now first be listening to three 20 minutes mini lectures by three distinguished persons whom I will introduce one by one uh, in, in front of their speeches. Then we have almost another hour for exchange and discussion, first between the panelists and me, and then you are all welcome to, uh, to take active part and uh, join in. As I said, our topic is a fascinating one. Do taboos play an essential role in culture and society? Or must we simply get rid of them? Well, I'll give you the answers right away. Um, yes, they do play an essential role. And uh, should we get rid of them? Well, perhaps not all of them. But uh, we'll come back to this. Most of us present here tonight live in extremely privileged, uh, free and open societies. But not all citizens in our countries enjoy a high level of freedom but live their life in influenced by severe restrictions due to, for example, poverty or religious conventions or abuse of power. And a considerable number of countries also witness restrictions in the fundamental freedom of expression through laws, authoritarian regimes, a growing number, surveillance and extremism ideologies. Taboos also influence the freedom of expression in, in the ways it is or is not practiced. And in that sense, taboos also mark some of the limits to such a basic human right as freedom of speech. Hold your dog back. And as an observer and commentator, I, uh, I would ask, uh, we might need some of, some of the taboos, don't we? And others, not, of course. A society has never improved or developed without brave individuals breaking boundaries and conventions and even breaking laws, illegitimate laws. We need people who challenge taboos continuously, I think. So then we have to ask uh, which taboos have positive consequences and which carry negative implications. Last year, Last spring, I wrote two separate columns in, in Aftenposten daily newspaper on Norwegian taboos, such as being poor, being a woman, and at the same time choosing not to have children, or being a man and getting raped, etc., etc. I got a huge response and lots of examples of new taboos I hadn't thought of, and I'm still asked to talk publicly about the topic, and I see it sense uh, an especially deep interest in taboos having to do with everyday life and the private sphere. But there are others. Well, I'm just an amateur and a, an observer in this uh, topic, so let's listen to the three experts instead. Um, I mentioned the main topics of their, of their mini-lectures. Paul Johan Carlsen will speak in defense of the elephant in the room. Why are taboos also useful? If we are to coexist as humans and find inner peace in a dangerous world, we must, must make space for taboos in our lives. Rachel Jolly recently edited a themed issue of Index on Censorship, and you'll find some uh, free copies uh, outside this hall. What's the taboo? Why breaking down social barriers matters? And she will present a global survey of taboos and discuss the history of the taboos in uh, certain countries. Why do taboos lead to censorship? Maria Stepanova from Russia will focus on taboos in, in Russia and paying special attention to government-inspired taboos that were virtually non-existent until a few years ago, but which are now shaped and encouraged by government propaganda. And she will also discuss the tabooization of historic knowledge. So let's, uh, let's go to the mini-lectures. First, Paul Johan Carlsen, and I'll say a few words about him, uh, his personal profile also. He's a Norwegian writer and lecturer, editor-in-chief of the website Psychologisk Enno, and um, has earlier served at several other journals as an editor during the last decade. He holds an a master's degree in psychology from New York University. He commutes now between uh, Oslo and uh, New York. And he has a PhD in psychology from the University of Oslo. Writes both uh, non-fiction and literary fiction. 
Uh, he, uh, he, his debut was a novel called Daimler, and it's out now, published, uh, published, published uh, right now in, in the US, uh, with a new novel entitled The Stormwater Drains in Canberra, uh, about growing up in northern Norway and other, other exotic places in the world. But uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps his main, uh, main literary output is, uh, uh, is the non-fiction books, such as the self-help book, uh, How to Improve Your Memory, uh, Psychology in a Nutshell, and What is Memory, and an introductory textbook also, Psychology, the first introduction. He's also a regular columnist and expert in national newspapers. So, Paul Johan, we look forward to hearing you. Please. Okay. Um, I heard that uh, James Cook, uh, the explorer, was uh, the one credited for bringing the word taboo into the English language. He was exploring um, the South Pacific, Australia, New Zealand, and other islands. And uh, he came across some natives and he wanted to build social relations and uh, he asked them to eat with them. And they declined, saying taboo, taboo. Um, Apparently, they had um, recently um, cleaned and prepared uh, a corpse for burial. So they weren't allowed to use their hands for eating. Um, so during this period, they would have other people help them eat. They would have other people feed them. So that they declined. And I, I would say there might be practical reasons why that this is a good idea, but also they were, allowed, uh, sorry, they were not allowed to eat for months and months after the burial of someone important. So that was a taboo, to eat with your own hands. I don't think it's surprising that taboos, sorry, taboos come into existence. Uh, they are powerful tools for guiding behavior in a hyper-social world. And I think that when we approach our own taboos, we approach dangerous territory. We approach the places we'd rather not go. So I'm going to take you on a short journey to New York, Stockholm, and Cambridge. And we're going to, in, uh, to visit some influential psychologists who study taboos and avoidance behaviors in a broad sense. According to these researchers, taboos play a pretty natural part in our life. Uh, they consider them as a necessary part of our shared moral psychology the part that binds us together as groups. And also at the individual level, taboos may help us cope with pain. Okay, so first to New York. Jonathan Haidt is a professor of ethical leadership at New York University. And he argues that it's in our nature to be critical, judgmental, and moralistic. We continuously judge whether people are doing the right thing or not. As a graduate student, he made up stories of harmless taboo violations. Is it okay to eat your dog? I mean, it was just killed by a car. And you heard that some Chinese people find uh, dog meat pretty delicious. So what's the harm in trying? No one's going to know about it. Um, is it okay for a brother and a sister to kiss passionately on the mouth? Is it okay to cut up an old flag and use the rags to clean the bathroom? So he asked children and adults from different countries and different social classes these type of questions. And people said, no, it's not okay. People had no problem passing judgment. I actually remember um, being 21 year old and on a vacation trip to Turkey with my boyfriend at the time, and we were kissing. It was a pretty discreet place, no one was there, we thought, and it was a beautiful view of the ocean, so it was just like the perfect place to start kissing. Um, and this person, an like, older guy, farmer perhaps, he said no. So he took us by surprise and he stopped. Um, yeah, we passed judgments. This is not the sort of type of thing you're supposed to do here. 
um, he really seemed to care. He, 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 well, he, well, he didn't seem offended. He just seemed to care about us. Don't do this. It's, it's not the right thing to do. It's taking you down the wrong road. Anyway, so uh, Jonathan Haidt was asking these type of questions to, to people in the US and other countries. And he had found that children were the most moralistic of all. And also people from lower classes, people with less education, much more moralistic. And people from um, collectivistic cultures, sociocentric cultures, less individualistic cultures, were more likely to pass judgments on these type of questions. Yet, he also asked why. Why is it wrong? And people found it pretty hard to come up with reasons for the judgments. They were struggling. It's just not the thing you do. You're not supposed to do that. It's just not the thing you do. It's wrong. And based on this type of findings, he argued that our moral psychology consists of two parts. A past and intuitive part that passes judgments past, and, and a slow and reasoning part that come up with the explanations later. This is also in accordance with the Daniel Kahneman's thinking of the, the slow and the fast system. Um, so, Haidt calls the first part of the moral system the elephant, and the second part the rider. And we think we're the rider. We're on top of the elephant and in charge. But for the most part, the rider is just being taken along by the elephant, a much more powerful creature. And the rider is just rationalizing what the elephant is already doing. And Haidt makes the argument that if you want to control people's behavior, you're much better off convincing the elephant than the rider. And effective taboos speak very well with the elephant. According to Jonathan Haidt, Haidt uh, the Western media and the political left have a very narrow concept of what constitutes moral behavior. A too narrow concept. We typically ask, is this har harmful? Is it unfair? So hate instead compares our moral machi machinery with a tongue, let's say the elephant tongue. And this tongue has not just two taste buds, it has six taste buds. And everything that happens to us and every action that happens is part of our diet. We are tasting it and we react in one way or another. So we, do just, we ask more questions than just, is it harmful, is it unfair? We also ask questions like, is it this being too dominant? Are you being too dominant now? Is this disloyal? Are you being disloyal? Is this respectful or subversive of tradition? Is there a lack of decency? Has something sacred been violated? So all these type of questions are part of the elephant's tongue. And we react pretty much intuitively and spontaneously. And it's a rich moral psychology. Um, Haidt argues that if you want to bind people together as a group, you really want to be highly more realistic. And if you want people to join your cause, you really want to activate all six taste buds. According to Haidt, taboos really activate the sixth taste bud. Is there a lack of decency? Has something sacred been violated? And when you break a taboo, the very first reaction you should, you should expect is unease or even disgust. Okay, on to Stockholm. Andreas Olsson is a researcher at the Memory Lab at Karolinska Institute. He is interested in what he calls avoidance traditions. Avoidance traditions. 
So he is interested in the things we, as a society, avoid doing, or avoid mentioning, or avoid talking about. And he argues that taboos are maintained by threat of punishment. And this threat is much more important than any actual punishment. Based on the computer simulations and psychological experiments, he argues that there are two ingredients necessary to create taboos. Two ingredients. The first ingredient is danger, a sense of risk, of uncertainty, a fear of punishment, of being ostracized. That's the first ingredient. The second ingredient is copying behavior. And we're pretty good at copying other people's behavior. However, uh, Andreas also finds that when danger is a salient feature of our environment, we are particularly prone to pay attention to what other people are doing. Or don't. There is, of course, a lot of information to be gained from studying what other people do. They may know something that we don't. Yeah, and in times of danger, you're very likely to copy other people and avoid abuse. You don't want to stick out. So, lesson. If you, if you want to maintain a taboo, you will certainly want to create an atmosphere where the whole group feels under threat. Also, Andreas also finds, if you want to see people challenge taboos, you may want to try reducing the sense of threat one way or another, and also to introduce rewards. Olsen has found that people are much more creative and explorative in their behavior if the possibility of reward is a salient part of the environment. Under this condition, people are pretty likely to deviate. Okay, finally to Cambridge, and also our private taboos. Many people have experienced horrible things that they never talk about. And if you try to raise the issue, they may shut down, change the topic, and walk away. So they actively seem to suppress what has happened to them. They rather not talk about it, not even think about it. Okay, so my field is psychology, and psychologists have long believed in the talking cure. If you want inner peace, we should be talking about things. We should particularly be talking about the things that are hard to talk about, right? We're supposed to address the elephants in the room. In Cambridge, two memory researchers have shown recently that active suppression is actually a pretty effective cure if you want peace of mind. Two people in particular, it's Emily Holmes and a guy called Michael Anderson. In a number of experiments, Emily Holmes showed participants pretty traumatic images of a traffic, image, uh, traffic accident. Because this is a controlled laboratory environment, she is not trying to cause trauma, but she is exposing people to something pretty horrific. And half an hour after showing people the movie, half of the participants were asked to, to play a computer game for 10 minutes. To, to play a computer game. Yeah. And during the following week, the group that played computer games was much less haunted by involuntary memory flashbacks. And the procedure is believed to work because it distracts participants from think thinking about the trauma right after the events. So Emily Holmes, of course, believes this has uh, implications for how to treat post-traumatic stress disorder. 
Um, she has also shown that um, you can reactivate people's memories and then distract them by making them play this computer game, and it will actually make those memories less robust in the future. They like it to forget. And this other researcher, Michael Anderson, has done other experiments to show that memories are much more likely to fade if you actively try not to think about it. So this goes totally against the talking cure. I remember the worst Christmas gift I ever gave my father. Uh, so my father has Alzheimer's disease, and it's been going on for seven years now. And this was at a pretty early stage. And I thought giving him a couple of memory aids would be a brilliant idea. So my mother opened the present for my father, and no, she didn't spend very much time with that present. We moved on. So that was not the best time. It was a taboo situation to be addressing that issue during Christmas Eve. It was not the best day. And this is not a family secret. But this seems to work at times in everyday life. So some sort of mind control seems to establish personal taboos. Okay, to sum things up, taboos really do play a natural part in our personal and social life. They're really powerful tools. They guide our behavior, they seem to help us stick together as a group, and they may even offer us some peace of mind. But of course, this is only a part of the story. And we will soon learn that there is much more to taboos, and it can be a pretty effective weapon while we also try to use it. Thank you very much so far. Thank you, Paul. Rachel Jolly is uh, an editor of the Index on Censorship magazine. But uh, she started as a news reporter on a regional newspaper, moved on to writing for um, magazines, newspapers and websites in the UK and internationally, including The Times, Financial Times and The Guardian. And uh, she has been editorial director at the think tank British Future and managing editor for the monthly magazine Business Traveller and also editor of Business Traveller Middle East. Seems like you have got lots of fascinating traveling and um, she has also been head of online for the Fabian Society. She writes regularly now in addition to the Index on Censorship for the New Statesman and other publications and she also co-wrote a play Murdering the Truth uh, performed at Greenwich uh, Theatre in London. Kiss uh, Rachel, the floor is yours. Um, the idea for this, uh, thank you, that's so great. Um, the idea for this issue of the magazine that was uh, touched on briefly came out of a discussion that I, was, I had with the chair of the index board, David Aronovich, who is a columnist for the Times in the UK. Um, we're sitting around thinking, you know, what, what could we talk about in terms of looking at uh, freedom of expression and censorship in a different way? Um, ended up with taboos and the thing is the more that I talked about it and the more that I thought about it it turned out there were so many taboos in life in everyone's life that you, you don't you don't think of them like that and um, it, it just turned into you know such a fruitful topic so I'm really glad that we could uh, follow up what happened in the magazine with um, discussion tonight because I think it's there's something for everyone <laughs> in the topic so um, what are taboos and why do they matter? Throughout history, in every country, in every family, there have been subjects which people have been told not to talk about. Teenage pregnancy, mental illness, cancer, divorce, tuberculosis, forced adoption, the Holocaust, death and religion. Different in every place, different in every family, but the list goes on and on. Some are national, some religious, some familial. I'm sure if you thought about the taboos in your family for a minute, you would realise there were a few. Subjects that you couldn't talk about around the dinner table at Christmas, 
or when everybody got together? Was there a moment when you were a child when you realised you were asking questions about something that no one, just no one, talked about? <coughs> the power of the ta taboo is that when you're not allowed to talk about something, then it can be challenged. And therein lies its power. I mean, I certainly remember Christmases in my family where um, we weren't big on talking in politics about politics in my family, and it was sort of the atmosphere was such that if anyone uh, contradicted someone else, you were supposed to close down that conversation because you know people got upset and that was difficult and we didn't like things like that. Um, and that way, you know, no one ever got challenged. So one person with one opinion never really got to uh, like what it was. Another person who might disagree with them never really got to say what that was. And we, we you know, we never. We never got to discuss within the family what those things were. In the mid-60s in Britain, around 16,000 women were forced to give up their babies for adoption, many against their will. Many of the babies ended up thousands of miles away from their mothers. Yet this st story only finally started to be become public in the 1990s. This was something that was not known to many except those that experienced it, and of course they didn't speak about it. It left some of the women ill and struggling for the rest of their lives. They were told by families, sometimes churches and sometimes other people, not to talk about it. It, was, it might bring shame on the family, is a phrase that came up again and again, and something which you know, I'm sure we hear about uh, in the news and in other places. Today we can question why the system was allowed and why many of the young women felt they were given no choice. But new taboos replace old ones. The idea of things we shouldn't talk about or question doesn't go away. In 2016, teenage girls in some areas of India are told not to mention they're having a period, not to ask for painkillers, not to sit on a bed, not to touch their hair oil, and not to pray. This was something you were not expected to discuss. Better, in fact, to pretend that it just doesn't happen. These restrictions were a taboo subject not open to challenge, until some girls started to challenge it. Rahina Saeed, now 20, along with two other young women, has started to go into schools in Mumbra, near Mumbai, and talk to groups of women about the taboos imposed on them during menstruation. She said, We thought, why not talk of an issue which women don't speak about and suffer silently? We suffered due to silences surrounding this issue, and we didn't want others to go through the same. These three girls are starting to challenge these long-held practices. They've been told that these rules were stated in the scriptures, but when they read those same passages themselves, they found that while they, while they spoke about women resting during menstruation, nothing was written about banning them from prayer. This story and many others show why the act of silencing can damage society. Why should girls be treated like outcasts once a month and banned from doing the most normal things in life? The answer is because somehow this has become accepted. Once these three young women began to see that the structures they were being told to follow were damaging, not being able to ask for painkillers, for instance, they luckily had the strength to stand up against those restrictions and question them. And by doing so, they began to change the dynamic. No doubt other women will be encouraged to question the rules, and that's how society starts to change over time by questioning power. In El Salvador, where abortion is illegal under any circumstances, even where the pregnant woman could die, the way that the law is enforced means that women who suffer pregnancy complications and lose a baby can wake up with a police officer standing next to them. That abortion law is so draconian that women who lose their baby through illness can find themselves under investigation and charged with manslaughter. Under the ferocity of this law, many women are too frightened to talk to anyone about concerns they might have about pregnancy, let alone discuss abortion. In 2008, a 25-year-old woman, Guadalupe Vasquez, was sentenced to a 30-year sentence after suffering a miscarriage under those abortion laws. So you can imagine the taboo around talking about this issue. Under these conditions, 
Well, then are often going to be too frightened to discuss anything about health complications during their pregnancy with a doctor or even anyone else. Sometimes this will result in putting lives at risk. Certainly, it creates a society afraid to talk about these issues and women living in fear. Throughout history, taboos have been established to keep populations under control. Best not talk about it is the spoken version of the nodded instruction to put something off limits. In the not too distant past in the UK, societal disapproval would be rained down on those who ate something other than fish on Fridays. Or children who played outside on a Sunday or didn't wear a hat to church. In the US, the Western Baptist Church tells its female followers that it's forbidden for them to cut their hair. But why? Who decided these were the rules and how do they change? Sometimes it takes a generational shift, such as we've seen in Ireland with the vote to change the law on gay marriage, to not only challenge a taboo, but challenge the law and change it and keep that social stigma in place. There's a tipping point theory where a body of resistance builds up to such a point that the dam breaks and the public suddenly demands another way is found and an older way is discarded. But societal disapproval is fierce and individuals who deviate from the normal can find themselves isolated and alone. As Palestinian academic Mohammed Duadi discovered when he took a group of his students to Auschwitz to learn about the Holocaust, Duadi felt it was important for his university students to learn about this period of history. He saw his duty as one of teaching, not to ignore a particular part of, of, of the past. Others saw it as the action of a traitor, accusing him of ignoring the suffering of the Palestinians. He knew he was tackling a taboo subject, but hadn't expected the reaction to be so violent. He received death threats, and he's now moved his family to Washington, D.C., partly for safety reasons. Societies often endanger lives by creating taboos. These societal barriers are often out of date, sometimes stemming from religious thinking that has been left unchallenged or from historic traditions. Sometimes these values are deeply embedded and any action can result in violence or damage to the individual who refuses to conform. Generally, the prohibition that is inherent in a taboo includes the idea that its breach or defiance will be followed by some kind of trouble to the offender, such as a lack of success. A lack of success in hunting or fishing or some other um, thing that's important to them, such as sickness, miscarriage or death. Sometimes taboos relate to admitting that you have an illness or admitting that someone in your family has an illness. Some might remember this being the case with cancer a decade or two ago. Alastair Campbell, who um, is best known for um, being the communications guru to Tony Blair, is also now a mental health campaigner wrote for the magazine recently um, about the Snickers around mental health um, and said he distinctly remembers a bit, um, when he was younger that no one would talk about cancer and it was just something that no one admitted if it happened to someone in their family. Those social stigmas can mean that individuals don't feel able to seek medical help, are afraid about to admit a problem, sometimes, um, as we already discussed, even going to the doctor until it's too late. Other taboos might relate to an oversensitivity to another factor, um, such as health or security, or worries about being accused of something, such as being, being uh, called a racist. A recent study found marriage amongst first cousins um, greatly increased birth defects and the chance of a baby dying early. Historically, the Bangladeshi and Pakistani communities in Britain were more likely than other groups to choose marriage to a first cousin. The massive Born in Bradford study, which looked at the births of 13,000 children, also found there had been an aversion to talking about this issue in the past because of cultural sensitivities. Not tackling taboos can leave people in, living in fear, unable to tackle restrictions in their lives or call for social change. Not talking about taboos can cost lives. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Please let me introduce uh, Maria Stepanova, and thank you for coming uh, all the way from Moscow. 
And Maria is a publisher and a poet, and perhaps one of the most visible figures in post-Soviet Russia. She was an important and uh, innovative poet already by the time of Putin's accession, but as I read somewhere, the times called for a tougher, more public role. And today she is not only a poet, but also a journalist, publisher, and a powerful voice for press freedom. And she's the founder of Kolta RU, the only independent, crowdfunded source of information that exists in, in Russia today. And quite successful with 900,000 unique visitors a month. And this online publication has been called uh, uh, something like a, a Russian Huffington Post in format and style, and uh, also compared to the New York Review of Books for the scope and depth of its, uh, its long essays. So we look forward to listening to you, Marianne. Please. Thank you, Kutolo. Thank you so much for inviting me, and thank you all for being here. It's an honor to be here with you today. Um, speaking of taboos seems especially important today in the framework of the new conservatism, a disease or tendency that is spreading worldwide. It has different faces and different manifestations, different levels of radicality, but all the same, in the last few years, these tendencies have become relevant worldwide, not only in the Middle East or post-Soviet space, but also in the US and Europe. See Hungary, see Poland, see the latest events in Austria, or the sudden rise of the alternative for Deutschland. But all the same, the tendency is at its most spectacular when it comes to Russia, that is making, I mean, the Russian state is making it a, as a kind of a sales point or a brand, something specially tailored for the support of those who are not happy with the current state of things. Still, the Russian situation is quite special, and uh, I consider it to be especially important to stress the points of our differences, hoping that they will make even more evident the range and depth of the global problem. For centuries and centuries, well, the relationship of the Russian state and the Russian people was asymmetric, tragically distorted. The amount of the state's presence in everyday life of its citizens was enormous. And uh, as a result, a private person, a private being, was denied of any subjectivity, not only any chance of decision-making, of taking responsibilities, but also of having preferences, of regulating it, his own life. The state, in its totality, was, was insisting on being the only decision-maker, the sole source of any change. People were doomed to passivity, forced to being indifferent to their own fate. In fact, the main taboo, or maybe even the only existing taboo, was subjectivity the whole business of having opinions and putting them into action. And the result was quite tragic, or you can call it comic, because when the necessity of changes was becoming evident, there was simply no one to start them, uh, with the one exception of the state itself. Besides its traditional role of the traditional keeper and the source of bans and prohibitions, the Russian authorities we were kind of forced to become the reforming force, crossing the borders, transgressing, thus shocking the people to the level of violent resistance. That was the course of the church reform in the 17th century, the Russian version of reformation that was carried out by the state authorities causing violent protests among the people. And the reforms of Peter the Great, this rapid and radical turn to the West, that changed the whole course of the Russian history. It was also met with protests in every social strata, from peasants to nobility. It is a paradox of sorts. Absolute power of the state puts it in a schizoid situation. 
it is becoming a sole actor on the political scene, representing both progress and regress, change and, and resistance. It cannot escape moving forward, changing the rules, breaking the boundaries. But as soon as the people are encouraged by the changes, as soon as they are moving forward to participate, the authorities immediately emerge in their different function, judging and punishing anyone who dares to cross the border. In effect, on the whole territory of Russia, especially after the final fusion of the state and the church, the state is becoming the only sacral entity, defining the frames of possible and impossible in social, political, cultural, and religious life. And in the, in the same time, it is the only entity that has a permission to redo or even demolish the present structures of society. This ambiguity defines, in my opinion, not only the tragic course of Russian history, but also a frame of our perception of taboos and borders. The contemporary Russia, and for a good reason, is seen as a, the domain of taboos and prohibitions, of gender blindness, paternalism, ultra-conservatism, chauvinism, and home violence, and it is so. But mainly, strange as it may seem, on the face level of slogans, state propaganda, and state-sponsored political activism. A good number of taboos based on traditional values emerged only in the last five or seven years with the great help of the Russian state TV with its hate speech and false evidence. For instance, the anti-gay movement in Russia was totally state-inspired and state-controlled, starting with a number of barbaric laws and hate speech in the official media. Now, in several regions of Russia, you can simply get jailed for what is called propaganda of homosexuality. This means uh, putting the issue in any kind of positive, uh, positive context. I can give a few examples, maybe afterwards, because it is again one more tragic and comic and at the same time uh, situation when uh, things that are happening could be could become a, a, a base or, uh, or a plot for a comical movie. Uh, but its consequences can be quite, quite tragic. On the same time, in factual reality, you can practice any kind of sex as soon as you don't declare it as a meaningful part of your identity. We're having an interesting picture here, a total absence of the majority of taboos on the level of personal relations, with a few emissions maybe, and a total ban on admitting the fact in your public life. You could do anything in the darkness of your room, but in the light of publicity, you are denied the right to be different. That goes for political life as well as for the sexual life. There is no difference for the state between gay and human rights activists, because what it tries to control is not moral issues, but political consequences. This difference between the official and unofficial was always important for the Russian reality, especially after the 70 years of Soviet era with its flow of constantly rewritten political history and the unofficial family true stories kept at home like a hidden treasure. But now this ambiguity, this hybrid way of life is becoming the base for the state policy. Taboos are simultaneously ignored and cultivated and sometimes even invented for the state's purposes. The difference between what you declare and what you practice is becoming an essential part of a new pact between the state and the citizen, creating the logic of constant instability, a world without rules where everything is permitted and banned at the same time. I was always mesmerized by the characteristic self-centeredness of the Russian intellectual landscape, the level of detachment and even indifference to the main problems of the outer world. It is very visible in the framework of contemporary matters and debates. Russia is tied to the West with millions of cultural, economical, political links. Yet it is not involved in the discussion whether it comes to the questions of ecology or gender or even the refugee crisis. 
these things in Russia are not becoming a subject, uh, a subject of internal debate or even international dialogue. We are simply not interested. The problems are shrugged away as featherweight, non-significant, but non-significant compared to what? What are the real problems, the real topics of constant debate in contemporary Russia? The problems that are involving all the social stratas, all the intellectuals, state authorities, and TV audiences. Uh, I have to say it is, well, Joseph Stalin and his place in history, or the World War II, or the Russian Revolution. The masses are virtually mesmerized by the never-ending past, which is the real realm of taboos no one dares to tackle. Two years ago, at the anniversary of the siege of Leningrad, at the Dost, that is the, the only Russian independent TV channel, was a provocative question was asked. Someone asked if it would be better to surrender the city to the enemy in order to, to save hundreds of thousands of human lives. It wasn't a statement, simply a question, but the reaction was immediate and awful. After a few months of the press campaign that was led by the state authorities, all the cable channels decided to stop working with the Dosts, and the channel was practically closed, and it took the owners years of efforts to make the audiences return. What is remarkable here is that none of the anti-Putin or pro-LGBT or anti-war statements you could hear in the channel was causing such a wide and violent reaction. It was a point of a total consensus between the state and the mass audience. But why? Why the past tends to be the hottest topic in Russia? Why the deeds of the dead seem to be more important than the problems of current times? And why it is so dangerous? I just read a news spot on a guy who killed his drinking companion because they had different views on the Russian Revolution. This sounds like an extreme joke, but it reflects a serious problem. Because the main taboo in contemporary Russia still is to be involved in the active life. What is prohibited is any attempt to control or regulate or change your everyday existence by your own will and without the state's permission. The inability to control the times present uh, means you have no hope for the future. The future is becoming a threat, something to be avoided by any price. Future is fearsome and present is unchangeable. So the only thing one may consider solid is the past, but it is a specially Russian past, uh, rewritten with every new ruler. It is the realm of speculations, projections, denied knowledge, and wild guesses. This unstable ground is the only place where people feel at home. That's why it stays the only territory of common interest, of violent arguments that are effectively distracting the people from the reality of today. All the taboo-breaking brain work is being done there, in the fields of the past. The important question for me is how to make it back to the real world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. I, I, I'm, I would like to mention uh, so, sort of Russian taboo history uh, after, after your talk. Uh, the house we are in now was from 1905 uh, a Russian embassy, and then in the 20s it became a Soviet embassy. And uh, the ambassador then in, uh, during the 20s was the world's first female uh, diplomat, uh, Madame Alexandra Kolontai. And she, uh, she, uh, she, she uh, was also a minister for social, social affairs in, uh, in the first Bolshevik governments. And, uh, but she was such a strong advocate for, for, uh, for liberated uh, love and, and free sexuality that uh, um, the leading communists uh, wanted to get rid of her. So they sent her to Norway 
<laughs> which he became widely popular. <laughs> and the 10 years anniversary for the Russian Revolution was uh, was uh, uh, was celebrated in this room in 1927. So, uh, just as a as a, an anecdote to Russian taboos, I would like to welcome you to the to the um, uh, table here in front, and we'd like to ask you some follow-up questions uh, before you can. You are welcome to comment on on. Um, each other, and uh, we'll very soon uh, let the audience also also raise questions or uh, make short uh, short speeches. But Maria, uh, I wonder. Uh, it strikes me that some some activities, some things you do, are evaluated as uh, taboos only in public, whereas it's, uh, it's okay to do them in, in private, uh, in, in, uh, in the darkness, in uh, uh, closed uh, circles. And that reminds me of, of, of the phenomenon of, of um, um, same, uh, same gender uh, sexuality in, for example, in, in um, Middle Eastern countries, in Muslim, Muslim countries. Um, it's uh, not legitimate to to um, to display it as a lifestyle and, and uh, to show it openly. But uh, uh, of course, we all know, and it's an established fact that that uh, uh, that uh, even Orthodox uh, Muslims uh, uh, take part in in uh, in uh, same-sex uh, activities. So, but morally, it, it's uh, equally bad if you if you have a moral standard, uh, either if it's uh, if it's hidden and, and in private or public. So, why this difference, and how how do authorities or, or lawmakers or others uh, um, legitimize this this difference, this uh, uh, peculiar practice between the public? open and the private, the hidden? Uh, well, in fact, they uh, just do not legitimize it. They simply ignore it. Uh, and, uh, well, when we are speaking about the Muslim community, the important difference is uh, there the taboos are based on the real religious experience. And uh, here in Russia, they are kind of hollow. They are devoid of any real meaning. So it is uh, much more easy to ignore it. Mm -hmm. yeah, Russia is a difficult country to understand because you are you are so clever uh, to 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 read the messages not not for what sentences state uh, letter by letter, but uh, well, Norwegian Scandinavians uh, have a deep seated trust in authorities and. Uh, most of the time also in media messages, but uh, you seem to have a, a quite different uh, attitude towards communication and, uh, and uh, statements about facts in Russia. Uh, well, of course, uh, um, I think that the, um, what, what the Russian authorities are doing is mostly words, but as we all know, words have consequences. And uh, as a result of years and years of state propaganda, awful things are starting to happen. For instance, there was a horrible crime that happened a few months ago in St. Petersburg. Uh, a journalist, uh, Dmitry Tzedikin, was killed and uh, he, he just simply disappeared and uh, no one knew what happened to him for a few days. And then uh, we uh, found out that he was simply killed by a guy who pretended to be gay to, 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 get, uh, to, to get closer to him. And he was seeing himself as a, as a tool of God's will. He was, his, his main idea was to, to, to kill the LGBT people uh, just because um, uh, God hates homosexuals, whatever. Uh, so words have the consequences, but uh, still, Dmitry was a public person that was making him visible. Uh, it is a balance. It is always a balance. Uh, uh, but it is much more complicated than the first level of declarations. 
is always more diverse. Mm. Just one more follow-up question to you. Uh, since we are now in uh, in in, um, in the middle of the Pride Week uh, in in Oslo and in many other cities in the world, uh, celebrating uh, gay, lesbian, uh, transsexual, and, and uh, bisexual liberation, the letters grow in number. It's now L LGBT, and also I. I've seen uh, the number of uh, number of specialties uh, is uh, is growing. But uh, the question is relevant. You you offered to to uh, mention some of the more peculiar consequences or, or or specific instances of anti LGBT laws in Russia. How do they work, and what are the, what are the consequences of them? Well, I can give you a few examples. They are not as luckily not as horrible as uh, the, the, the first story I was telling. For instance, we at Colta were uh, doing a screening of uh, an interesting documentary called uh, Kids 404. It is the name of a law that uh, bans you from uh, any kind of homosexual propaganda, whatever it means. And uh, in fact, what it means is when you are facing a youngster, a teenager, who is starting to define himself or herself as gay, you are unable to encourage him. You cannot tell him he is normal. It is okay with you because it can be considered uh, as a homo, uh, as a the propaganda of homosexuality, and it could lead you to, to a prison sentence. So we did a small, for maybe a hundred persons, screening of this of the film. And uh, as it is quite usual in Moscow, in front of the club, there was a bunch of uh, Russian Orthodox activists who were shouting slogans and uh, behaving outrageously. But it is something you're getting used to. But then when the screening started, we were raided by the police. They entered, they broke the door, they were in, they were going through the rows and looking for passports. They were searching for anyone underage, because if they would find any teenager, it would mean we are uh, doing the same you know, propaganda thing. Or the other issue, and a funny one, we were uh, participating in a big cultural festival in Moscow. And uh, we were doing a program specially designed for the kids, for toddlers. And there was one uh, small play uh, for, for five years old kids uh, about a boy who is trying to find, to find a pillow that is satisfying for him. And he, is, he encounters different kinds of pillows, and then he finds one that, that, that is special, and he is happy with it. And then out of blue, Ministry of Culture emerges, and the, so the, the, the staging of this small play is prohibited, because it is also considered to be propaganda of homosexuality. I mean, uh, that's how it works. Uh, and that's why I'm calling this a uh, tragic framework code mm -hmm. at the same time. Yeah. Thank you, Maria. Uh, Rachel, there have been, so through history, so many taboos surrounding illnesses. And uh, it's not only a historic phenomenon. I, 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 I know people uh, with a cancer diagnosis um, who who keep, keep it to themselves still, uh, if, if at all possible, because they do not want to become their diagnosis. It, there are so many strong facts connected to cancer still today. Uh, but um, perhaps cancer is not, not a taboo in uh, countries like Norway and Great Britain in 2016, but are there any illnesses you would regard as, uh, as uh, taboos today? Of course you're right. But through history, um, people uh, were both embarrassed and afraid about talking about illnesses 
One, because you know, they related to parts of the body sometimes that one didn't speak about, and it was that whole thing about people not wanting to go to see a doctor because they didn't even know how to express the, the things that were wrong with them. But also because they often got, uh, they, you know, the implications were ostr they, would, they could be ostracised by their community, so um, things like smallpox and TB and things like that. Um, a friend of mine is running a campaign currently, um, um, and um, it's, uh, it's about uh, it, uh, a mesh that is um, being put into women's uteruses after pregnancy and there's lots of complications with this and she um, has been highlighting it and um, calling for much more um, medical awareness of this and the thing that she's finding difficult is just that conversation is difficult for people I mean there is that's a that's a conversation that people are embarrassed about having but some people you know so there is that sort of that sort of difficulty those kind of taboos around words about describing things to about your, you know, about your body that people just find just impossible or incredibly difficult to, to tackle. And, and of course, in that case, then it, it means that those subjects don't um, necessarily get spotlighted and things that might be going on can get ignored for a long time. So, you know, I think there's plenty of taboos left in, the, in all sorts of parts of the world about different illnesses. And, um, and, and though I do think it's useful to think back on history and to see what what's helped us through this hmm. uh, there, there is a British documentary series on TV called Pindia Sigtomer in Norwegian and, and uh, embarrassing illnesses in English and well I must admit it's one of my favorite uh, <laughs> favorite series <laughs> sounds great though yeah <laughs> it's uh, yeah, but, but uh, the doctors are tackling it uh, in, a, in, a, in a very calm manner and helping people. And, and, uh, and, it, and it's amazing that, it, that, that the patients uh, are, are willing to, to, to be on national television. Yeah, mm. not, not, so, for, not for everyone. I, mean. well, I, I wondered if I could just go back to something that Marie mm. said about the taboos around history, because I think that's a big mm. subject for every country. There are, there are these, you know, these national mythologies around um, history um, that make it very hard for people to challenge something that has been embedded in a national culture. Um, and because of the anniversary, um, we've been looking a lot at the World War One in uh, the UK and obviously across the world um, in the last year. And there's so many stories about, for instance, the song, you know, what was the story then and how it was later perceived but one of the big ones that um, I came across was the story of the national or international um, flu epidemic um, which was one of the great untold stories of the First World War that um, most countries um, censored the news of the flu epidemic so that people didn't even know that it was happening so um, in the end millions of people died. And I think it's, it's that sort of the mythology of war and the mis mythology of historical moments is an incredibly taboo subject, I think, all around the world. I have a one, I think, simple, perhaps stupid question, either to Rachel or, or Paul. Uh, what, what is the typical situation around taboos and how they, how they are shaped or, or how they are born, the genesis of taboos, so to speak? Are they, are they mostly growing organically? And no one quite knowing how they came about, or, or can can a taboo be constructed at one specific time, so to speak, by decision? What's the normal situation? The genesis of taboos, how do they come into the world? That's a really nice question. And and, uh, I have have no answer. That's hard to answer. But um, I do think that this. Guy Andreas Lauer, uh, also in uh, Stockholm, he was able to create a taboo situation in the, the lab basically by mm. deciding, designing the experiment. So uh, I, I guess it's possible for one person to make this decision, and if you have the power, you can enforce it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So, so um, taboos imply always perhaps a uh, power relation. Yeah, I think so. There, mm. there is some power involved. 
Well, it seems like you can break it down into lots of different power groups to me. So from the government, so we're thinking, you know, uh, propaganda, for instance, can be one way. Um, and often taboo subjects come out of religions um, or social convention. Things, things have always happened that way. So, you know, that's the way we have to do it. Hmm. Just one last question to the to the to the panel before we, we invite the audience to take part. Um, if I understood you correctly, Paul, you, you you said that children, people from lower social classes and from collectivistic cultures, are, are tend to be more moralistic than others and more vulnerable uh, to to taboos or, or to to uh, uh, hold taboos. Um, well, Perhaps you hinted at the explanation, but could you could you say a bit more about why this is so? Yeah, uh, Hayes thought that. Um, oh, he, he observed that these people from mm -hmm. these like it's not social norms; it's an universal truth that you're not supposed to kiss your brother or sister. You're not supposed to do this and that. It's yeah. a universal truth. But more educated people are more likely to say, "Oh, it's a question about taste." I, I personally, I would not like to do that. But I mean, some people may. Want to do it so with education people seem to be more likely to say it's a social norm more than a sacred value that's universal mm. and social norms can be different in a different school different mm. environment mm. so if you are a person uh, with, with a um, um, ability to objectify and to discover that something happening or some fact is a construction, social construction, then you are able to, to uh, see something as a, as a taboo, as something not naturally given. Yeah, so you could probably be better able at identifying that this is something that could be, be changed. Mm. So education seems to actually have that effect on those mm. people. Is there lots of uh, lots of scientific research going on in, in different fields of taboos in, in the fields that you know, psychology, I, I, anthropology? I would say too little. Uh, so mm. I'm glad that you're making me more aware of this issue. So I have dig, dug down into the literature. It's, it's not that much mm. in psychology. Mm. 